It kind of kills me that kids don't know Lethal Weapon now. Because... Oh my god! Because to me, those movies were like, that was what everybody in my family could agree on. <laughs> so I have seen those movies so many times. Roger Murtaugh is my favorite right. character. Like, obviously I have my own issues with Mel Gibson. Oh yeah, everyone does. Everyone does. But that formula and the, the fact that it so quickly moved into I'm too old for this shit, I was like, that's so good. You want to talk about a movie about toxic masculinity. The beginning of that movie is he's 40 years old. Danny Glover, Murtaugh's 40 years old. He's in a tub naked, like taking a bath. His whole fucking family comes in and goes, happy birthday, daddy. Like, no suds, no nothing. It's like the clearest indication that this man is emasculated. They're like, and then the whole movie he spends trying to like prove like, I'm a fucking man. Right. To the point that, like, at the end of that movie, it just shows you how crazy men get about this stuff. It's so... <laughs> like, there's something... That I used to have this little cartoon that I would show kids that was, like, these little tiny dots, and it was, like, Lethal Weapon 1, 2, and 3, and 4. And then finally I had to stop doing it because kids were like, what's Lethal Weapon? And I was just like... I can't believe... It's a... Door is closed. It's a popular show now. It's not like, it's not in the popular conversation anymore. It is like, like now, like what people will know those guys for is not Lethal Weapon. Like it's gone. Which is kind of fascinating that that also can happen, right? That you can be like, it's like <laughs> the police cat. Like all the things that I hear up on are like gone. Like I remember that that was like what I grew up on is like my cultural conversation my like references and illusions are all like and it's so funny because I write YA yeah. and the number of times I've had an editor to be like you cannot use that nobody knows what you're talking I about I just put them in anyway the thing that people really liked in the 80s is no longer popular right people don't buy it anymore because it's you know this idea of like authenticity is like more and more a thing that people are concerned about, right? Like being authentic, being honest. So people say, like with Southern Bastards, it always bothers me because people always go like, "This is a very authentic comic," and I'm like, "That's an interesting thing to say about it." I'm like this might be an honest comic in the sense that it's emotionally honest and maybe intellectually honest but it is totally a myth it's totally a confluence of myths that you know well it's kind of about mythologies right like it's about the myth of the strong man like this myth of this like these mythic battles and and these like sort of mythic deaths you know like the weight that we give like I kind of love that part of it which is about how everybody is kind of loosely tied to these myths whether or not you're invested in them and that it's a myth that has real consequences depending on who you are yeah I mean I I think especially and this happens with like diverse books too of like the larger meaning of what something is supposed to represent and I think that I try to think as little as possible about the larger meaning of whatever I'm doing. And I try to just stay like burrow, burrowed in the specifics of what I'm trying to say in any given moment. It's hard for people to sometimes grasp that something can be intensely personal and not autobiographical. Like, all of this comes from and is drawn from my experience in one way or another, but it is not me. Well, you come from a, li a literary background, and like to me, like, I think I try to I write things in a weird structure and a lot of my structure like is like because it's like books I love don't have like put a bow on it right fuck it push it like see what you can get out of it like see like if you fail yeah I want everyone to go like you're amazing throw money at me yeah but I also I'm more concerned with if they do that when I did something crazy and it's sometimes doing the crazy thing is is leaning into 
the part of it that everybody else thinks is corny or thinks is trophy and going like, no, let's earnest do it. I mean, I think the worst thing you can try to do is create something that will be successful. That's a pit. You, just can't you know what it. I mean? The most successful book I've ever worked on, I did not think that it was going to fly with any larger audience than the 200 lesbians that I imagined buying our first book. Like, I really thought this is so specific to this, like, very specific story that I wanted to tell for Jillian. Uh, and I... And then when we, uh, we were both like, you know, who's going to, you know, who does this speak to? Like, when they were sort of like imagining the target audience, I was like, I have no idea who the target audience for this is. I don't care. I'm like, let's take it. See, like, I always make the argument that we have this really weird cultural divide in part because we grew up in a time as comic book readers when comics were not ubiquitous as, no. as brands, right? Like, no. as things. I think we have this major disconnect between the fact that the older audience doesn't, they on some level feel like it's all been stolen from them. I'm sure they do. And it's important, I'm a little bit empathetic to it, even though I think that the reasons don't excuse the behavior. Sure. I mean, I always say it's like a Tom, it's like Tom Petty for me, because I'm 43, so that's my, that's my reference point. I love point. Tom Petty, so I continue. I fucking love Tom Petty. So, you go to a Tom Petty concert, and, you know, he plays whatever song, like, You and I Will Meet Again or whatever, whatever's your favorite song, and he plays it differently. And you're like, oh, it's not, it's not the way. Yeah, yeah, it's not the radio it's version. It's not, yeah, no. Yeah. And it's like, not even that it's not the radio version, it's not the song that's been in your head that's your favorite fucking song. And someone plays it differently and you're like, that's not okay. Because it like hits you in this way that you're like, no, 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 this is very... And if someone else was to do like an accordion version of the song, I'd be like, fuck you, it's my fucking song. Don't fucking play that song on the accordion. Like, I don't know, that's not cool. But, so I get that. And I think too, you know, there's always a new generation of people who are re-falling in love with something and they don't have all those reference points. And like, I'm that way, it's like, I am new, when I'm new to something and I don't know the history of it, like, is it possible that I love it less than the people who know the history of the whole thing? Like, if you fall in love with, like, the newer version of the thing... I just love it differently, I think. Yeah, it's just a different thing. And I think it's, like, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. No, I think it's... Like I said, like, my tastes have changed. I don't understand why people who've loved stuff this long can not be excited by a new people coming. I don't know. I mean, this is like a, the most fucking ulterior motive fucking straight man guy thing I probably could ever say, but when I was a kid, I was just like, God, please let a girl come to a comic book. <laughs> yeah. Fucking Police, Police Academy. Academy. Anything Airplane. Steven Gutenberg. Oh my At what point does Tom Hanks? Right, usurp. I think it was three men and a baby, and Steve Gutenberg was the least interesting of the three men. It was like all of a sudden everybody saw who Steve Gutenberg really was, and they were like, "Oh," and that's like it was that was it.